We appreciate everyone coming out tonight. Happy to see you here. My name is David McLeod. I'm with Transition Watkins, sponsor of tonight's event. We wanted to start with the land acknowledgement. And I apologize for having to read this, but this is the acknowledgement that uh, we used here at Buff, and we want to honor that. And also, I think it's extremely well written, so I just want to get every word in. We acknowledge this land is the traditional territory of the Lummi and Nipsack peoples. Their presence is imbued in these mountains, valleys, waterways, and shorelines. May we nurture our relationship with our Spanish neighbors and share responsibilities to their homelands where we all reside today. Um, next, I'd like to thank our sponsors. The sponsors tonight are the Regenerate Cascadia Tour. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Claire. And all those that are involved with in Regenerate Cascadia, which we'll learn more about tonight. Transition Walkman. I was one of the co-initiators with Transition Walkman back in 2010. Um, and since then, we've done a lot of different projects. And uh, you know, we try to engage the head, engage the head, the heart, and the hands. So we need to learn things sometimes. We need to connect to our heart, and then we need to take action, put our hands to work. And so we've been working to rebuild community resilience and self-reliance since then. Uh, we've been um, gone through a lot of uh, slow stages and inactive stages, but uh, every once in a while we'll still hold events like this, and we'll see what and unfolds tonight and see where we want to go next. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, Transition Walkham is now a project of Sustainable Bellingham. Sustainable Bellingham has been around um, since about 2004, and uh, they're the organization that holds 5013 c nonprofit status. Uh, and so we've been working together since, since the outset but uh, I think it was last February we made it official that we're transition walking is now a project of Sustainable Bellingham. Um, the third sponsor, or the fourth sponsor, is Inspiration Farm. Thank you, Brian Kirkley. Brian's done a huge amount in making tonight's event happen, and we're very, very fortunate to have Brian and his farm in our community. Some of our co-sponsors, Sustainable Connections, the Multi-Faith Network for Climate Justice, Resources for Sustainable Communities, Bellingham Unitarian Fellowship, which has donated the space we're meeting in tonight, Coast and Carbon Trust, Edipos Wildlife Sanctuary, the River Farm, thank you, Julie, um, Samson Rope Technologies, Brandywine Kitchen, and the Watkins Million Trees Project. How many of you were here in 2019 when uh, Joe Brewer spoke last along with Michael Dowd? Raise your hand and see. Quite a few people. Um, I want to let you know that unfortunately Michael Dowd passed away on October 7th. And so we wanted to just take a moment of honoring him and his life and his work. Um, you know, I really found him to be a really thoughtful, caring, kind, humble, and wise human being. And he really just lived his values. Um, he was all about sharing intimate, sacred relationship with the earth. And he was also just really about facing reality and the circumstances that we're in. He um, came to a place where he called his work getting to that place of post doom but no gloom. So accepting the reality of, of facing hard times, but you know, getting on the other side of you call it Tia the end of the world as we know it. 
But the end of the world as we know it is not the end of the world. And so we still have lives to lead. To lead. And um, we can find joy and meaning in what we do. And um, I'm going to ask Joe to say a few words about Michael in a minute. But last time in 2019, I remember like almost the first thing that Joe said, referring to Michael, he said that, Michael is someone who is so beautifully wrapped in grief in a handkerchief of happy tears. So, yeah, I just wanted to honor Michael now tonight. What can I say about Joe Brewer? Very much like Michael, you know, um, he's, a, he's a real human being. And in the short time that he was here in 2019, it felt like we became good friends very quickly. And um, Joe is both a cognitive scientist and a systems scientist, complexity explorer, and someone who really put his his hands where his heart is. He's been working to regenerate um, communities. He spent four years in Colombia, Bucarina, and. and doing amazing work there. And he's here now um, doing this, if you haven't heard, uh, this is all about a regeneration tour, regeneration, regenerate Cascadia activation tour. So that's what we're going to learn about tonight. Um, yeah, so without further ado, Joe Good evening, everyone. I want to start by um, moving to remember, because the last time I saw my friend Michael Dowd was right here. And I was sitting here when he started to speak. And I remember one of the things that he said. And I feel like if I say it too, and say it similar to he, the way he did, then maybe I'll have a little moment of remembering my friend. Because he said that there is a fine line, and he was on one side of the room, and he said, there's a fine line between hubris, and then he ran across the room, and humility. And he was telling us that we are filled with hubris, with like nonsense, with like these grandiose delusions about the separation of humans from the rest of reality, and we need to have the humility to honor what we truly are, which is momentary, ephemeral, and soon to depart expressions of life as part of this planet. So for me to stand here tonight, remembering my friend, who, as another friend that he and I share in common, Vicki Robin, she said that, uh, she actually felt he died complete because he always told people that he loved them. He always made it very clear to express his feelings. And I want to express my feelings tonight about the work that Michael and I shared, the work of helping humanity to find its way home. And so I'm here to talk about how to regenerate Cascadia and I've given this talk now in 12 other towns and cities in the last three weeks. And so we started in the Columbia River Gorge, went to Eugene, Oregon, to Portland, then to Seattle, no, then to Vashon Island, then to Seattle, then to Whidbey Island, then to Port Townsend, then to Victoria, then to Gabriola Island. And now we're coming here and our tour is actually gonna end when we go to the Skagit Valley and then back to Seattle in the next few days. And in the span of 30 days, we're having the same conversation to weave that conversation into a way of organizing. Because what I wanna talk about tonight is an idea whose time has come. And as my friend John Raymer here in the front said tonight, because he heard us speaking about this in Langley over in Woodby Island. Gosh, was that two years ago? No, it was like 10 days ago or something. Um, and he's like, 
For 40 years, we've known what to do. Why didn't we do it? And you'll see that's part of the story that I'm going to share tonight is what we need to do to save humanity from extinction, what we need to do to restore health and vitality to the living systems of the planet, it's been known for a long time. And the story was lost. Some of us didn't lose it, but it was lost. Most of us don't know it. And so what I want to talk to you about tonight is, is something that's, I'm just going to focus on one word right here, this word how. How? Because if I were to ask you, should we regenerate the Cascadia bioregion? Should we bring salmon back to the rivers? Should we restore the old growth forests? Should we restore the biodiversity of the marine ecosystems in the Salish Sea? The answer would be yes, we should. But how? How do we do the work we need to do at the scale that is required? Because the work we have to do is something much more than planting a tree or creating a garden. We have to do things like restore the hydrological connectivity of the South American continent as the Amazon rainforest is collapsing. Like, this is the kind of scale we need to work at. And so I want to talk to you about the regeneration of Cascadia, the Cascadia bioregion. Cascadia is a name given to a collection of watersheds and integrated tapestry of landscapes that includes the entire Cascade mountain range, every river and every tributary and stream that drains into the Salish Sea, and every river and every stream that drains into the Columbia Basin, the Columbia River system, which spans from Southern Alaska to Northern California, from the coastline to the interior of Idaho and even part of Wyoming because the Snake River drains out of Yellowstone into the Columbia River and eventually finds its way to the sea on the border between Oregon and Washington. And what I want to talk to you about is how important it is for us to realize that that dotted line through the Strait of Juan de Fuca that says there's a United States to the south and a Canada to the north, I can verify it because I took the the ferry from Port Townsend to Victoria just a few days ago, I looked everywhere and I did not see that dotted line. It's not real. It's a fiction. It's imaginary. But the water mixing the Salish Sea and swirling through the Gulf Islands and the San Juan Islands, it's real. And we need to organize around what is real. So I want to talk to you tonight about how do we restore the health and vitality of living tapestries of landscapes to give humanity a rightful place in the future evolution of this planet. In order to do that, I want to make a point that's been made many times before, which is that if you look at the Earth from space, you will notice a complete absence of boundaries. They don't exist. Not only is there not a dashed line going through the Strait of Juan de Fuca, there's no line anywhere. So just look at this image and notice that it's a completely integrated, holistic, living system. If I were to ask you, where is the water, you would see that it's in the ocean, but then on land, it's in all of the rivers and lakes, but it's also in the atmosphere, in the clouds. But even where there's no atmosphere, there's water vapor. So a better question would be, where is there not water in this image? There's not a single pixel without water. There's water everywhere. It integrates everything. And this is important because this interweaving of the different parts of the earth creates a powerful systemic risk that places humanity in jeopardy of driving itself, along with millions of other species, to extinction. And I want to talk to you about those interdependencies because we need to understand how they work so that we can see what to do about it. So to start talking about regeneration at this large scale, 
I want to just get a little snapshot of where we are right now. And I want to do that using a framework called the Planetary Boundaries Framework. And just by a show of hands, who here has heard of Planetary Boundaries? Most of you. This is good. What I found is a lot of people have heard of the Planetary Boundaries, but they don't really know what they are. So I want to explain what they are. The Planetary Boundaries is a framework developed by the Stockholm Resilience Center. It's a collaboration of 3,500 different scientists who study the Earth, and they asked a really powerful question back in 2009. The question they asked was this. With everything that we know about the dynamic Earth, are there any thresholds or boundaries that if we crossed it, we would leave a safe operating space for humanity and our ability to have large-scale agriculture, permanent human settlements, cities, empires, civilizations, global supply chains, all of these things could just go out the window because they depend upon the stability of the Earth to maintain a stable climate and other key features. So they said, are there any thresholds that if we crossed even one, we would leave this space and our globalized complex societies would probably go away. When they asked this question, they gathered a bunch of researchers, had conferences, published papers, and they came out and they said, oh, we know there are nine of these boundaries. There are nine of them. Climate change, which is at the top, climate change is only one of them. We talk a lot about climate change, but it's only one. There's also biosphere integrity, which is that as you prune away ecosystems, they eventually collapse and unravel. And so biosphere integrity is a measure of how quickly we are causing extinctions to occur. And we're in the midst right now of a mass extinction event being caused by human activities. So biosphere integrity is the measurement of how quickly we are causing extinctions. Then you have land system change, which is when you take healthy intact ecosystems and you degrade them, like cutting down forest and replacing it with monoculture agriculture, or replacing it with urban landscapes, or causing it to become a desert. Then you have fresh water use. If you recall, 1% of all of the water in the world is fresh water, 99% is salt water, and if that fresh water is contaminated or unavailable, you're not gonna have a very complex society. Then there's biogeochemical flows, which is the reactive nitrogen and phosphorus used in synthetic fertilizers and agriculture. And when it runs off the land into our rivers and runs into the oceans, it causes massive dead zones and threatens to collapse the base of the food tree, the whole food web of the planet. Then there's ocean acidification, which is that if the ocean becomes too acidic, calcium carbonate begins to dissolve. Calcium carbonate is what makes the body of coral in coral reefs. It's what makes the, bottle, the bodies of mussels and of mollusks. They start to dissolve. Then there's atmospheric aerosol loading, which is a way of saying air pollution. There's too much air pollution. Stratospheric ozone depletion is another one, which is that there's a layer of ozone in the stratosphere that absorbs the ultraviolet radiation and if that ozone layer wasn't there, there would no longer be any life on any of the continents of the Earth. And then there's a last, the ninth one, which is called novel entities, which is any chemical created by humans that the planet doesn't know how to deal with. So see, they come up with nine. And so if, if you ask the question, are there any thresholds or boundaries that if crossed, would cause this experiment in our globalized civilization to probably go away, and possibly even any permanent human settlements, seems like it's a pretty big question, so there's a natural follow-up. How are we doing? Have we crossed any of them? So they went and did the research, and in 2015 they said, oh, we have crossed four. We've crossed the planetary boundaries for climate change, the rate of extinction, the destruction of ecosystems, which is called land system change, and this reactive nitrogen and phosphorus that's creating dead zones at the mouth of every major river on Earth. Okay, then the research continued. They got better data, better methods, and in 2021, they came back and said, oops, 
we crossed the boundaries for freshwater use and ocean acidification. Now, we didn't cross the boundary between 2015 and 2021, just the research got good enough that they could confirm it. And then the research continued, and in 2022, they added novel entities, microplastics. Microplastics are synthetic polymers created by humans that are long-lasting, that can be hormone disruptors and interrupt the development of organisms across their lifespan, and microplastics can now be found in every single drop of breast milk of every woman on Earth. They can be found in every water supply on Earth, in, your, in our aquifers, our rivers, our lakes, our oceans, and they even find them in clouds above the mountains. What this image tells us is that the only way that humanity is going to find its way into the future is to completely transform the human presence as part of the earth. If you look at this information and ask, uh, will we solve this by changing our light bulbs? Or what if we replace the internal combustion engine of our single occupancy vehicles with an electric battery in our single occupancy vehicles where the battery requires us to scrape and destroy the ocean floor and cut off the tops of mountains to get lithium, and we call that clean energy. You can see that we have been given absolutely absurd consumer choices that are forced to be about individual action so that we feel completely powerless to do anything about what's really going on. And what's really going on is humans are destabilizing the planet's ability to regulate itself. We have to completely reimagine the human presence as part of the Earth. This is a graphic that represents a summary of the tipping points of the Earth system, which helps us see why these planetary boundaries exist. Because the planetary boundaries tell us when we cross these tipping points. And I'll just name a couple. The Greenland ice sheet. With global warming, as the Greenland ice sheet starts to melt, it'll cause sea level rise. But also, if too much fresh water dumps into the North Atlantic, it shuts down the mixing process of what's called thermohaline circulation, or the great conveyor belt of the world's ocean, and the whole world ocean stops mixing heat the same way. Or what if we cut down too much of the Amazon rainforest and it collapses? Or what if the West Antarctic ice sheet falls into the ocean, causing sea levels to rise by four or five meters? Or what if the permafrost in Siberia begins to melt and four meters, like 16 feet of depth of frozen vegetation, because it's frozen, it doesn't decompose. As it warms, it begins to decompose and the microorganisms consuming it release methane into the atmosphere. There are now craters exploding out of the permafrost in Siberia as the permafrost melts. So see, these kinds of tipping points are what get crossed when we cross over the planetary boundaries. Now, what's important about this Oh, wait, actually, I'm going to just sort of jump ahead because I want to jump to the point. You can see that as we do things like melt the ice in the Arctic Ocean, we cause all of our weather systems to break down. And you can see right there that little pattern in North America, that's what brings you your rain in the winter here in the Northwest. These are the kinds of patterns that are starting to break down. And what this teaches us is that the Earth is a whole system where everything is related to everything else, and there are cascading relationships. You change one thing, it changes another, it changes another. And it's all interdependent. And there can be significant time delays. Also, the breakdown unfolds across space and time. And I want to draw your attention to the word across. Across means changes in one place have effects in other places, and it actually happens in multiple places at the same time. There's a silver lining in this message. There's a secret gift in this message. First of all, we now know a huge amount about how the earth works. 
much more than we've ever known before. We know the earth and its relationships better than ever before. The other thing is that the very interdependencies that create the systemic risk are exactly the same relationships that can give rise to systemic resilience. That if we understand how changes in one part of the planet can affect another, then we can start to see how to create a collaboration between different parts of the planet to restore the stability and the supports from one place to another. So I've traveled all over the world and I've visited a lot of regenerative projects. I've regener I visited permaculture farms, learning centers, regenerative agriculture, reforestation projects. I visited places where they're doing riparian res restoration of stream beds. Lots of different kinds of projects and every one of them was bounded by the edge of a plot of land. It's like I've got my 20 acre farm, I'm doing great work on my farm. But every piece of land is embedded within a larger set of ecological connections. So let's say your permaculture farm is in a watershed and someone drops contaminants into the water upstream and it runs across your land. You see that these larger ecological connections are really important. Luckily for us, these ecological connections already organize themselves into larger holistic landscapes. Things like coastal estuaries, watersheds, mountain ranges, islands, or a local climate pattern that creates a monsoon of recurring rain. There are holistic, larger scale systems that tell us how the ecological connections connect to each place. And every landscape is embedded within a larger set of planetary processes, such as the evaporation of water over the Pacific that's carried through the air and drops rain or snow on the Cascade Mountains. There are these larger planetary processes. Now, when I look across these four levels and I ask myself, where is the pathway to planetary sustainability? Where is the pathway to restoring health to the planet? I looked at this for a long time and I found that it does not exist at any of these four levels. You can't go to one of these levels and figure out how to get to planetary sustainability. But if you shift your perspective, you start to see that the pathway we must walk goes across the levels. It goes across them. And as we go up and down in these levels, we start to see what we need to do. So if you have that permaculture farm embedded in a watershed, there are probably other regenerative projects in the same watershed and there are ecological connections among them. So you can begin to organize collections of regenerative projects across larger organizing patterns of the land that are already organized as holistic landscapes. Which leads to a really profound statement that sounds kind of deceptive, kind of simple which is this, everything that happens anywhere on earth happens somewhere. It always happens somewhere. And because the earth is a web of relationships and everything is connected to everything else, every single place can become a focal point of transformational change because it's connected to everywhere else. So when we look at the earth like this, and we look at the North American continent, and we ask, where are we on the earth? Where is the place that we are? And the answer is, we're right there. We're in a specific place. Every place has the power to guide us and show us how that place is important to the whole planet. So here's a little closer view. We're in Bellingham. You can see that there's a lot of structure in the land around us. You can see that there's coastline, there are bodies of water, right? There are different shapes. There's different complexity in the landscape. When you zoom out a little bit, it's like, oh my gosh, Bellingham is part of a much larger landscape system. See, that's the Fraser River that's going over to Vancouver. 
And here's Bellingham with some other drainages coming down, some other watersheds. See, there's all this structure there. All of that structure tells us how to regenerate this large landscape. Now, I was sort of astonished when I saw this because I can basically see a completely destroyed landscape. It's completely destroyed. If you zoom in, you'll see farmland, you'll see erosion, you won't see forest. You'll see this massively degraded landscape. How would we ever regenerate something so large? Well, the secret is this. Every place on Earth has a unique geologic history that tells you the shapes and the patterns that gave rise to the kind of place that it is. Every place on Earth has a unique ecological history like no other place on Earth that tells you how did life evolve in this place, what kind of life exists here, what kinds of plants, what kinds of animals, what kinds of ecosystems that are unique to this place. And every place on Earth, if humans existed there, has a unique cultural history. And when you look at this place and you start to put together its geologic, its ecological, and its cultural history, you start to construct a story of this place. And you start to see the richness of how did life form here? What kind of life exists here? If humans have been here before, how did they live in harmony with this place? And as you put this story of place together, you begin to create whole system understandings of this place. And what's amazing about this is this story is not finished. It's still happening. Right now in this room, we are living out the story of this place. I drove down today. We came from Victoria across the ferry and then came down. I entered into the unfolding and emerging story of this place. And if you live in this place and you start to put together its history and you start to learn how does flourishing, how does well-being, how does health work in this place, you start to be able to imagine the regenerative futures for this place. You might notice, oh, there used to be salmon in this river, but there aren't any more. Maybe there should be salmon again. There used to be beavers with lots of little dams bringing water into the land, but we got rid of all of those. Maybe we should bring them back. Oh, there were indigenous people who lived here, and they had particular ways of honoring the health and well-being of the rivers and raising their children and having sustainable harvests of fish and of whatever plants they harvested for textiles or for food or for medicine. Maybe we should learn to do that. And you start to see that the story of this place tells us how we should live in this place and what we would need to do to restore this place. So you see, place is incredibly powerful for creating transformational change that can accumulate over time. Let's look at how this works with an example. This is a picture I took from Google Earth. And right there is Eugene, Oregon. North is this way. And I want you to notice that in this place, in this picture, you can see there are some places that are more degraded than others. So I have a daughter who's almost seven years old. She loves to draw with crayons and, and colored pencils. And if I was to ask my daughter, um, where are the most degraded places in this image? Could you color them in for me? She'd probably color them in something like that. Because it's the valleys and the watersheds where the rivers come down, where in the floodplains, those alluvial floodplains of those rivers is where they cut down the forest to create agriculture. At the confluence of the Mackenzie and the Willamette River is where Eugene and Springfield have been placed, these urban landscapes that are heavily degraded ecologically. And you start to see that the land shows us the shape of its own connectivity. And that the place that we would go to start to regenerate and restore health to this scene would be restoring these valleys. And just look at the one in the middle. That one is about 10 miles long and maybe three or four miles across. If you looked at how much land, how many private pieces of land there are, there may be about a, a hundred pieces of land. 
And you could imagine going and visiting and knocking on the doors of all of those people, of walking from one end of it to another, of mapping out where its ecological connections are. This is a human scale of management. It's not difficult to imagine beginning a process of weaving together a series of projects across something that's 10 miles long by four miles across. This is a human scale of organizing which means we can imagine how we would begin to regenerate this landscape by looking at these valleys. And they're at a human scale of organizing. Now, when we go to a larger scale, now I've turned it around and north is this way, because it's Portland on one end and Eugene on the other. This is the Willamette Valley in Western Oregon. And look how degraded it is. It's thoroughly deforested. It's really degraded. And it's something like 100 miles north to south, maybe 50 miles east to west. How would we ever regenerate something so large? And again, if you took your crayons and started coloring in the most degraded places, you would start with the valleys and the watersheds. Now, I didn't color in all of them, but start adding them up. You see the three of them in the previous picture are right up there, just outside of Eugene. And you start to see that maybe there are 40, maybe there are 50 of these. Each of them could be an organized project to collaborate around the restoration of a valley. And we start to see how to regenerate Western Oregon, right? But then when we go out a larger scale, this is the Columbia River Basin. 174 rivers drain into the Columbia. It's 258,000 square miles about the same size as the drainage of the Colorado River. How would you ever regenerate that? But look, there's the Willamette Valley. And you can see the same pattern of local organizing projects within the shape of the land done in parallel could be repeated across the entire Columbia Basin. And what we start to see is that when we look at all of the watersheds of Cascadia, this blue area is the Columbia Basin. That yellow one up there is the Fraser River, which, by the way, is half of the fresh water in the Salish Sea, comes from the Fraser River. And you start to see that this is a powerful way of organizing landscapes, that we could organize ourselves locally around the shape of our landscapes, the way that life does it. And now you can start to imagine a mycelial web of human projects, human collaborations to regenerate landscapes and tapestries of landscapes. And so let's say that on this bioregional activation tour that we're doing right now, where we're visiting a lot of places, we're in the Columbia River Gorge, then Eugene, then Portland, then Vashon Island, then Seattle, been traveling around. What if all those places start organizing around the regeneration of their landscapes? And maybe this is so exciting and so inspiring and so empowering that some people down there on the Snake River start getting wind of it and they start doing it too. And you begin to see how we could regenerate the entire Cascadia bioregion by doing parallel projects in nested levels of reality, from local landscapes to larger tapestries of landscapes to entire basins of watersheds to entire mountain ranges to whatever is needed. It's a very simple logic. So if we're gonna regenerate bioregions at these large scales, we can already see that the land shows us how life is organized because it's organized in the movements of water across our landscapes. The question becomes, how should humans organize within those landscapes? What are the human structures of collaboration for the regeneration of bioregions? How does that work? Well, again, we organize ourselves by the land. And within the landscapes, the land systems, we create bioregional learning centers, which is that we figure out how to learn about this place. What is the story of this place? How does everyone learn the story of this place? What are the native plants? How do you harvest them? How do you plant them? How do you process them to make medicine or to make textiles or to make natural fibers or to make food or to make construction materials? You see, you start to have 
a patterning of creating bioregional learning centers as a way of organizing how do we learn about this place. And we need to create territorial governance because we have to be able to collaborate, to set priorities, to be able to mobilize resources, to allocate them in an equitable way, to create frameworks of collaboration. So we have to create territorial governance. And because all of this is organized by land, we can start to create tapestries of local regenerative projects and ecosystems of learning organized within our landscapes. All of this requires a huge amount of cooperation. So we have to design pro-social contexts, which means we need to create shared identity and purpose. For example, do we all want salmon in this river? That could be a shared purpose. And the shared identity is everyone who shares that purpose. And then with shared identity and purpose, you need equitable distribution of benefits based on how much people contribute. Those who contribute more should benefit more and everyone should feel it's fair, right? You should have fair and inclusive decision-making. You should have fast and fair conflict resolution. Conflict comes up. If you have multiple groups, you need collaboration between the groups. So you have these ways of creating the context in which collaboration occurs to achieve collective outcomes, so we have to design for that. And so as we start to think about this scale of work, we begin to see that we need to understand how life organizes itself, which brings us back to the concept of a bioregion. You might have noticed, I didn't define a bioregion. What is that? Well, bioregion is just short for two words, biological region, right? Or for those of you who've heard it as biocultural region, culture is the expression of behavior for animals that have culture, which are all animals, so they're all biological, so all culture is a subset of biology. Ooh, that's fun. It's still biological regions. Which is to say, every living being has ways of behaving in its landscape, and there is a natural geography, a spatial range in which the entire life context of that organism exists. Let's look at it with a simple example. What is the bioregion for starfish? Well, starfish have a life context defined geographically. It's the intertidal zone, right? You go to the coastline, there's high tide and there's low tide. And there might be tidal pools in between when the water is low. And that creates the entire context for them to find food shelter, for them to reproduce, and for them to have healthy living as an entire population of starfish. So starfish have a bioregion. It turns out every living organism has a bioregion. There's a geographic range for honeybees, oak trees, any kind of organism you can imagine, which means humans have bioregions too. But for humans, it gets more complicated because the geographic range for humans might depend on worldview, it might depend on the model of political organization, the kind of economy that they have. It might depend on the kind of technology that they use, which means the cultural dimension of human, uh, of human expression means that human bioregions can be pretty complex, but they still define the whole life context for a human population. What that means is that every bioregion, by definition, is the whole life context for the population, which means the bioregion is the model for the whole life system, where you say, how do you create sustainability? How do you create regeneration? How do you create health and well-being? By having a harmonious life context, right? Which means we need to reorganize the human presence as part of the earth by becoming bioregions, by turning our economies and our culturals into bioregional expressions of life, where we have whole life systems organized around the place where we live. If that sounds like ancestral lifeways and indigenous lifeways, that's because it is. That's exactly what it is. And so if we start to imagine humans reorganizing our lives as bioregions, then our work is to create a planetary network of human bioregions and create learning exchanges between them. How do we regenerate this place? 
How does this place regenerate and help regenerate that place? And out of what they're learning, how does that help us? Because we have to do this as well as we possibly can. We need to create a planetary network of human bioregions. What needs to happen is this, right? We need to recreate the conditions for living locally in terms of material flows, in terms of integrated life systems, which is how do humans relate to the rest of life, the thriving of families and communities, and this needs to happen in every place on Earth. Now, I love this image right here because this is a map of eco-zones around the world, which is to say each place has a unique kind of soil and rocks, a kind of ecosystems, a kind of climate that lives there. And as you look around the world, you'll notice each color represents a different ecozone. And doesn't matter for our purposes what the colors represent, just notice that there are a lot of them. There's a huge diversity of ecozones. So we should expect a huge diversity of human economies and human cultures, each one adapted to its local place. This is what we would expect biologically. Humans should be able to find harmony with their landscape and the kind of houses you build will depend on the kind of place you live. The kind of food you eat will depend on the place you live, right? This is actually pretty obvious. And so we need to restore this. This is what we need to create. So you might have recalled, you know, at the beginning of my talk, I said some like shocking, scary, disturbing things about how much the whole planet's destabilizing and humans could go extinct and it's pretty scary. Well, it's not new news. The very first time anyone took a computer and programmed how exchanges happen in the global economy it was 1972. And in 1972, this computer simulation of the human economy, they created a scenario called business as usual. That's where that phrase comes from, was this study, where the study was called limits to growth because they showed that the, the planet is finite and if you cross certain thresholds, it destabilizes and breaks down. And in their business as usual scenario, they showed that the human population reaches its peak around 2040, but it starts to slow down around 2030, and then it very quickly drops. Now that was not meant to be a forecast. It was a scenario. They just made some assumptions and played it out. Unfortunately for us, that scenario has tracked reality pretty much perfectly, which means it's a pretty foreboding sign of where we're going. And so they knew that this was a possibility and it created a huge controversy. So, you know, there were lots of debates and discussions. What did they get wrong? Why is this a bunch of nonsense? Let our neoclassical econo economists tell us we can have infinite growth and, you know, other delusions that still dominate policymaking all the way to today. And a group of people gathered to talk about what should we do? How do we live within limits as a planetary species now that we have a planetary effect? And they met at a place in Hungary called Lake Balaton, so they called themselves the Balaton Group. And for 10 years, these great thinkers of sustainability met all around the world and asked, how do we get to planetary sustainability? In 1983, the lead author of Limits to Growth, Donella Meadows, she wrote an essay called A Brief History of the Balaton Group. So what did we learn in these 10 years? And this is a quote from that essay. Vernon Rutten, who's an economist, said, each agroeconomic region is so unique that the concept of transfer of technology is irrelevant. What's relevant is the transfer of the capacity to develop technology and institutions that are consistent with the cultural endowment and research endowment of each region. Every place has to learn how to live sustainably. And then Dana went on, Dana Meadows went on to say, after these 10 years of discussions came a vision of a number of centers where information and models about resources and the environment are housed. There would need to be many of these centers all over the world, each one responsible for a distinct bioregion. So she said this in 1983, 40 years ago. I was six years old when this came out. So, has anyone come up with a better way to get to planetary sustainability since 1983? 
No. We got all caught up in techno fixes and measuring carbon dioxide levels and all kinds of nonsense and silliness and distractions. We stopped talking about important things like consumption and human population and biosphere integrity. You know, biodiversity is a whole separate conversation from climate change, and they never really talk to each other, and it's completely insane. But actually, back in 1983, the best thinkers of that time said we need to create local living economies organized as bioregions and create bioregional learning centers in every one of them. This is 40 years ago. This is what we need to do now. It's really what we needed to do then. And so I want to show you a little bit about how we're doing this in a very different bioregion in another part of the world. This is a topographic map of the northern Andes in Colombia in South America. This area that's colored in is where I live. I live in a town called Barichara. And this area defines a climate system because there's a mountain range on the west and you can see those two mountains on the right coming up and going across. It makes a triangle. And those mountains are so tall that the only place where the moisture can get in is from the south and it creates a circulation and it creates a very well-defined regional climatic system. Inside that area is an ecosystem like no other on Earth. It's called the High Andes Tropical Dry Forest. It's 80% endemic species, meaning 8 out of 10 species exist nowhere else on Earth. And it's more than 95% deforested, and it's in the process of becoming a desert. And so I moved to this place in 2019. Actually, I moved there about two weeks after standing right here in this room. And I got there, and I stood right in this place. So that's the town of Barichara. Its, it's tourism slogan is the prettiest town in Colombia, which is probably true because it's really beautiful there. And what you can see here in the foreground is Bioparque Moncora, which is a community reforestation project. Everything here in the foreground looked like this little patch down in the corner of bare clay and rock in 2009. Two women, Camila and Vicky, went and started planting trees there. Most of the trees died, there was no soil, but they eventually they figured out what they were doing. And they started inviting kids from the schools and they started regenerating it. So I went to this place to see if I could help restore landscapes and rivers with my own daughter, who was almost three years old. When I arrived there, I did the permaculture thing, which is you show up, you start watching the patterns and you don't interrupt them until you have some understanding of what's going on. And then you start to work with those patterns. So what I noticed was there were a lot of regenerative projects, really good ones. They were fragmented and isolated. They didn't know about each other. So I started looking at how to connect them to each other across the landscape. How could we create a school of regeneration for an entire landscape? What would that look like? To do this, we needed a coherent way of organizing. So we identified four key patterns that operate at a territorial scale. In Barichara, all of the rivers are dead. They're dead. Either no water is in them at all, and when it rains, the water goes rushing, causing a lot of erosion, and runs into the canyon below. Or they're so contaminated that nothing can live in them. This is actually common all over Latin America. It's common all over Africa. It's common in many places. And so one of the things was the restoration of entire watersheds, which is that we start organizing watershed councils. When we do um, soil building and reforestation, we organize it from the top of a stream bed or a drainage, start working our way down. We can organize around the naturally occurring contours of the landscape itself. Second thing is, we created a learning center in Centropic Agroforestry, which is the methodology developed in Brazil. It's one of the fastest way to create mature forest. It's very labor intensive. It uses a lot of pruning techniques. And it also it uses a lot of advanced knowledge about how plants relate to each other. Because the idea is you want to minimize competition among the plants and have each of them fill their own niche and create support structures, centropic 
mutually beneficial relationships. So it's a really powerful way to grow a forest. So what we did is we invited a centropic teacher. We organized workshops. And every time we gave a workshop, we established a public demonstration site. We found a piece of land that was community land. We'd set up a demonstration site. And everyone who attended the workshop would be able to come back and practice in that site. But then because many of these participants had their own land, they went back to their land to practice. And we started doing technical field site visits which is bringing everyone who attended the workshops to visit everyone else's land. And they were learning across all of the landscapes, all the different places, how to restore forest. And this is forest that can grow food, medicinal plants, textiles, construction materials. Then we moved on to the transformation of local food systems. You know, most places, if you look at their food shed, the amount of food they produce is like 3% or less of what the people consume. It's like really, really scary. In Barichara, within 10 kilometers of the town, we grow 70% of our food, which is amazing. Now, Barichara has got 6,000 people. It's not that big. But within 10 kilometers in a heavily deforested area, we produce 70% of our food. So if we regenerate that land and replace it with agroforestry, we can get to 100%. So we're working on transforming the food system. And then we need to design different economic models based on solidarity and trust and cooperation. So one of the women in the community named Margarita, she set up a community innovation hub for food and local products that became a community store. There are currently about 80 local producers who sell their things in that store in exchange with each other. This is food, cosmetics, textiles, various kinds of things and we're creating different economic models. And see, with these four patterns, the pattern of restoring entire watersheds, of creating learning exchanges of reforestation that can create an alternative economic system, while experimenting with economic models and transforming the food system, we're beginning to create a pattern of regeneration at the scale of the entire landscape. One of the little um, secrets in this, one of the ideas that's super powerful, is that every bit of regenerative work that we do involves education. Because we're always learning new and different ways to do things. So in Barichara, we do education in a different way. In this image, you can see a man there in the goatee. That's Felipe. Felipe got the idea that maybe we would restore the dead rivers with the children. So he started an activity called Caminatas del Agua walking with the water, water walks. And so children started walking through the dead rivers and streams. They'd get permission from the landowners to cross their land. And then the children, these are children between the age of four and 10 years old. The children interview the adults. And the children ask, why is this river dead? Where did the water go? The adults, being Colombians, Remember that they lived through this period called La Violencia, this 58-year period of extreme violence. And the adults have to say to the children, I'm sorry, we were killing each other and our neighbors, and we were all afraid. And while we were fighting, the water went away. We cut down the forests, and the water went away. And their hearts were opened. And the children planted the seeds of conscience in the adults. Now, these children started engaging in an exploration. How could they restore the Barichara River and its 15 tributaries? And as they started exploring this, we brought adults who could give them guidance and help them learn how to plant trees, how to gather native seeds, and various kinds of things. And these children are so inspiring that indigenous elders, like this man from the Muisca culture, centered in Bogota, would come to bring guidance and advice to the children. And the children are leading the way. Here in this image on the left is a little girl. In this image, she's six years old. She's actually seven now. Her name's Quetzal. Quetzal is explaining how the kids are going to regenerate and restore the river. Now, you can't read what they're saying there, but I'll tell you my favorite one. Remember, Quetzal's six. She said, you know, one thing we could do is we could take straw and we could tie it together and then we could put mushrooms in it. And with those mushrooms, we could put it in the river and it would take out the contaminants. Mycoremediation. Quetzal likes to watch YouTube videos with her dad. 
these kids have really good ideas. What they need are adults who listen to them and take them seriously. That's what they need. This image over here on the left, or on your right, explains another principle for us. That's Gabriella and her granddaughter, Soraya. We have a practice in Barichara, which is that when we have important conversations among the adults, as often as we can, we bring the children to play in the middle of our conversation. Why? Because we want the children to remember what the grown-ups were talking about. And we want the adults to see directly in front of them who they are making decisions for. This creates integrity in how the community makes decisions, and it changes everything. It changes everything. So when I first arrived in Barichara, I was like the gringo from the north, right? And I show up there, and I'm like, huh, interesting. Here, that's the Bioparque, that sort of odd-shaped thing. That's that community reforestation project. But if you walk five minutes on a trail, there's another project called Fundacion Monte Chico, where they teach children earthen construction and how to process natural fibers from native plants. They teach this like fifth and sixth graders. And these things are five minute walk apart. When I arrived, they didn't know about each other and they were not collaborating. So I started seeing these projects so close to each other, so naturally aligned. And when I went online and started crowdfunding to raise money, I found a really great way to get them to collaborate. I said, hi, I'm the white guy from the north and I have money. Would you please help me to not screw up how the money shows up in your community? And I brought together 15 leaders of different projects and they created really great ways to spend the money. We immediately funded 15 projects. We've now funded more than 30 by getting them to collaborate with each other. But how do they collaborate with each other? This is a collection of the projects in Barichara. Now you can't read them, but I'll just name a couple. This one's called Agua Santa, which is a regenerative farm doing agroforestry and watershed restoration. Over here is Corasoma, where they work with groups of women who do healing processes to break cycles of trauma in the community. Over here is Cane Colibri, which is a community theater where they create theater performances, performances that teach indigenous cosmovision and ethics to help children form a relationship with nature. When you look at these different projects, like, ah, they're all great projects, but how should they work together? Which ones should collaborate? And it's not obvious. But when you look at them on a map, it's like, oh, that community theater is right here, and that regenerative farm's right there, and they're in the same drainage. And you start to see that you can organize with the, in this case, the Campesino school children to start restoring this watershed, this drainage. They can use the community theater as a learning space and they can learn techniques on the regenerative farm and they can do it among their neighbors and the land shows us how to work together. And so, this leads to what is a bioregional learning center and how does this work? How is a bioregional learning center different from other kinds of education? First, remember that this is about learning how to live in this place. What is the story of this place? How do we live here? So a bioregional learning center is about the coordination of learning processes. It may not even create any new educational offerings but they go out into the community and they look, what are all of the ways to learn about this place? How do we get them coordinated with each other? Which means there's a lot of mapping and knowledge sharing and creating understandings of how, what are all of the learning opportunities? What are all of the ways of learning in this place? How could they be coordinated with each other? How could they collaborate? How could we even have a systemic point of view about what, what is here? which means that the Bioregional Learning Center becomes the gateway into the regenerative projects. Because if you start to coordinate and map them and create an inventory of knowledge, then if someone shows up in the community and says, I'm really interested in learning about trauma healing and decolonization, go over here. I'm really interested in learning about native trees and how to grow them and do reforestation. Oh, you should go over there. 
and you have this wayfinding system. So someone who comes into the community knows where to go to learn what they want to learn. And this is true for someone who lives in the community too. There might be someone here that really wants to learn how to grow healthy soils, or wants to learn how to make natural fibers, or wants to learn indigenous ways of harvesting berries. A bioregional learning center would coordinate this knowledge and would be a gateway to learn where do you go to find that, ex that experience. Now, bioregional learning centers can include the best of our science and technology. Like in this region, it might be helpful to know what our computer simulations tell us about the risks of tsunamis from the big earthquake that's coming, right? And that requires advanced computing centers, people with PhDs, probably a university or a national lab. So the best advanced modeling and simulation helps us understand the risks of our place and the story of our place. So bioregional learning centers can bring together advanced scientific knowledge. But they also need to be balanced and integrated with indigenous perspectives from the place and a process of decolonization for all of our education. Bioregional learning centers can help us to do this. So I've met with a lot of indigenous leaders around the world, and they generally agree that yes, we need indigenous knowledge, we need their wisdom traditions, we need this to guide us, but we also need science and technology that will help us understand the world and how to work with it. We need both, and we need to bring them together. Notice that bioregional learning centers are both centralized and decentralized. They have centralized components of gathering knowledge and coordinating it so that the decentralized efforts can be autonomous but also coherent with each other. So bioregional learning centers can do all of this, which means you can create one without competing with anything that already exists. How does territorial governance work? Well, again, we start by mapping the local projects and helping to weave them together. Why is this about governance? Because to map the local projects, you have to find out how they're doing and what they can do, which means you need to gather the people who are leading those projects and bring them together. As you bring those people together, they will begin to identify shared priorities and needs across their projects. They will create criteria for selecting and prioritizing strategies and actions to move forward. They begin creating decision-making frameworks. As they do this, they will naturally start to form <coughs> landscape partnerships. So like if you wanted to bring salmon back to a stream, you might want an aquatic biologist. You might want someone who knows reforestation. You might want to talk with farmers. You might want to talk with school teachers. You can form landscape partnerships, multi-stakeholder groups around the landscape so that these uh, priorities that are identified can start to be addressed. And this leads to creating community funding structures, which is that you as a community need to know what are the most important things to do, how do we go about doing them, finding the resources and mobilizing them in service to this work. And it needs to be community-oriented because who knows best how to do this? Well, the members of the community doing the work. So they should be the ones making the decision about where the money should go or any other valuable resources that they may have. Notice that this is how you can mobilize the resources of the community in service to the community as a whole. What normally happens is local projects compete with each other for scarce resources. But when they're already organizing around a larger landscape, they are aligned in purpose, and they become more coherent and better organized, and they can mobilize the resources they need. This is how you cultivate local sovereignty. See, sovereignty isn't just a given. You don't say, oh, I have sovereignty, I live here. It's like, no, sovereignty is the capacity to act in an empowered way. It must be cultivated, it must be created, it must be structured. And when you have local projects forming partnerships and mobilizing resources, they can begin to act with local sovereignty. This creates stronger collaboration internally, a more coherent and stronger political collective identity, and therefore the sovereignty to decide 
what is allowed into the community and what is not. This is the way of creating territorial governance from the local projects developed by the people who care about this place. And so I just want to share this briefly because this is a model that shows us that this can be done with really good financial support. So like, if we need to do something like restore the entire Nooksack watershed or the entire Salish Sea, <clears throat> these large scale structures, these large scale systems, we're gonna need a lot of resources. So this is a model developed by the Common Land Foundation, which is based in the Netherlands. It was created um, by a person named Willem Verwerda, who's a tropical ecologist. And he's, he's from Amsterdam, so he has lots of rich friends. And he was talking to his rich friends and he tried to talk to them about ecology. He found that his, his friends who were smart in business were really ecological idiots. They were just dumb, they didn't get it. He would try and talk ecology and was like, Whoa! they just did not get it. So he's like, I need to find, you know, these people do care about the environment, they just don't know. So how can I talk to them in a way they can understand? So he kind of had to dumb it down and change the language and figure out how to talk about it in a way they could understand. And so he asked himself, um, has humanity ever mobilized like a billion dollars to do a project that takes 30 years? Has that ever happened before? Yeah, it happens all the time. They're called infrastructure projects. Like Brandon and I were talking about in Seattle, there's the link light rail system. The third expansion is gonna cost $58 billion. Just the third expansion of the light rail system. So there are these infrastructure projects and we know how to do them. So he's like, if I wanted to regenerate an entire landscape and create a regional economy that's regenerative, could I get these people to fund it? How would that work? Well, how do infrastructure projects work? For one thing, to do a large scale infrastructure project, it's gonna be a large scale and it's gonna take a long time. So he said, these projects need to be 100,000 hectares or larger, and they need to take 20 years or longer. And to manage this, you need a management team, right? To do a, a light rail system, you need someone that does contracting, someone who does the sourcing of materials, someone who does legal work. You have these processes that are maintained throughout the entire lifetime of the project. So to create a regenerative economy in a watershed, you need a core team that's managing the process. And they found that in practice, you need about $2 million per year to fund this team that is holding and weaving the process. So just do the math, $2 million a year, 20 years, $40 million. You need $40 million to support this process, to have a core team of people. It's between five and 20 people who are completely devoted to this process for 20 years. But that doesn't get you there because you also need these regenerative projects to become integrated with each other. Like I was talking with Brian earlier about how there are all these reforestation projects, but they don't have enough soil material. They don't have enough tree nurseries. So you have to build up their capacities and create supply chains and integrate them. And these things are called public goods infrastructure. Public goods means you create something that benefits everyone. Like if you're gonna have a knowledge economy Having an educated population is a public good. It just benefits everyone. So you invest in it together. So they found that they could convince people to fund about $5 million per year on average to support all the regenerative projects. And this core team is convening them, creating shared agendas, doing integrated management, helping them to come together. So there you have $5 million a year for the regenerative projects, five times 20, that's another million dollars. I'm sorry, $100 million. So you have $140 million to create a landscape scale regenerative economy. And what they found in practice is that regenerative businesses are not usually viable until about eight to 10 years after you've built up all this infrastructure. People who do investment, they call this the valley of death because that's where you have your project, your startup, and you're trying to do it, but you keep having to feed money into it just to keep it alive until it's integrated and mature enough. So they're basically saying you have to fund that until regenerative businesses can function. These businesses create a profit and therefore there's a tax base. And so only when you have a regenerative economy start to take off, does your local government start to understand what you're doing. And there's a time lag of eight to 10 years. This is what they found in landscapes around the world. 
but this is a way of talking about how do you raise $150 million to create a regenerative economy right here. They've been doing this around the world since 2012, and they've been gathering data about it, and it works. So more and more people are going to start to understand this. So we're talking about creating bioregional investment platforms where your projects that are organized within the landscape, that tapestry of projects, is also a portfolio. If there are 20 projects and you want someone to fund all of them, if one of them fails, 19 still succeeded, and you learned, that manages the risk, which makes it easier to mobilize larger resources so that you can fund the transition to a regenerative economy. And it works like this. We create our bioregional learning centers to coordinate the ecosystem of learning for our landscape. We start to create territorial governance to prioritize and allocate the resources to the needs of our community. We create integrated landscape management processes, which creates a flow of value between these different pieces. Or said another way, we weave the people in projects around their landscapes, which helps them to cooperate with each other better. This deepens their ability to organize themselves. And this is how you birth a regenerative economy. So you see, there are structures and patterns for doing this at the scale that is needed. And it's already been demonstrated in other parts of the world. So if you look at something like the Salish Sea, you see the Nooksacks right there, notice that the Salish Sea is already organized into watersheds. Isn't that convenient? So helpful. Can't you imagine doing this for every one of those? Each of them could have its own core team, its own tapestry of projects, its own bioregional learning center, its own community regeneration fund, right? But I just want you to notice, see where all these watersheds are? Now look at where the language families are for indigenous people. See, a language family is what happens after many generations of cultural exchange and trade. And you'll notice that the language families roughly correspond to the watersheds, but not exactly. Right? They actually stayed within their watersheds, and they exchanged over to the next one. This is a pretty good approximation of what regenerative economies were like before the colonizers arrived. So if you want to know how to build regenerative economies in the Salish Sea, isn't it convenient that all these people are still here looking for their own sovereignty and rights to regain sovereignty over their ancestral lands? And there's an opportunity to weave deep, lasting partnerships between regenerative practice and indigenous rights around the birth of regenerative economies. So if you want a reconciliation process, it goes deep. And so um, this starts to show the sort of the logic of our, re of our uh, Regenerate Cascadia tour. See, we started in the Columbia River Gorge at the beginning of October, went to Eugene and then Portland, then to Olympia, then Vashon, then Seattle, then Whidbey Island. Then we jumped over to Port Townsend, went to Victoria, Gabriola, now we're here in Bellingham. So we're almost finished with our tour. What we're doing is creating the same conversation in each of these places about how to organize in this way and how to collaborate between each place. What's amazing about this is in the span of 30 days, not only are we having conversations in each place, but there's a local organizing team that organized for us to come. You know, as Dave McLeod is up here talking about all the sponsors and the organizing and how Inspiration Farm is helping and there are three farms we're gonna to visit tomorrow and there's all this organizing here, which means just by coming and talking to all of you in 30 days, we have 14 local organizing teams that can collaborate with each other. And they're all having the same conversation because within the span of 30 days, we brought the same conversation to each place. And now you start to see the logic of what a bioregional activation is, is we're activating a conversation about bioregional regeneration that is patterned across the natural connectivity of this bioregion. And so when you look at something like the North American continent, how convenient it's organized around hydrological systems and watersheds. 
So my partner, Penny, who, where did Penny go? She's over here. Penny and I, back in January and February, we did a bioregional activation tour in the Great Lakes, where we went to the greater Tacaronto bioregion in southern Ontario, to the Finger Lakes and Genesee River of upstate New York, and the Cuyahoga River in northeastern Ohio. And we had parallel conversations about the regeneration of the Great Lakes. And now, months later, they're preparing a summit in February about the regeneration of the Great Lakes. Then in May and June, we went from the headwaters of the Colorado River in the western slope of the Rocky Mountains, all the way to the Sea of Cortez in Mexicali, Mexico, having conversations about what it would take to regenerate the Colorado. And a little over a month ago, there was a landscape leaders retreat for the people from all of the communities we visited to continue organizing around how to create bioregional learning centers and how to regenerate the Colorado Basin. And now we're here in Cascadia. You starting to see the pattern? Conversations are starting to emerge in the Ogallala Aquifer, in the Great Plains, in the Driftless region in Wisconsin and Minnesota. People are starting to realize that this is how you regenerate a continent. You see? It's nested levels all the way up and down. So as we build this pattern of conversations, we are weaving the pathway for humanity to reimagine itself into place and the nested levels of reality all the way up to the planet. This is the future of humanity. This is where we need to go. And it's happening right now. You're already part of it just by being here tonight. So you see, we can create bioregional networks on every continent on the planet. Now we might give Antarctica a pass, just focus on the other ones, go a little bit faster. But you see, we could do this across all the continents of the planet. This is how we regenerate the Earth. So we created, Penny and I with our partner Benji back in March, it's pretty new, we created the Design School for Regenerating Earth. It says people all over the world are gathering to regenerate the Earth at the bioregional scale and organize into a planetary network of learning exchanges between landscapes. So we are holding conversations between the Great Lakes, the Colorado Basin, Cascadia, the Northern Andes, and we have other places popping up, like the western part of India and in other parts of the world. People are starting to join this conversation about how do we create a learning network around the planet. Now, if you'd like to help pay for our gas as we're traveling around, you can buy a copy of my book in the back, The Design Pathway for Regenerating Earth. But actually, you're already in its pages because we are living out the design pathway right now. Right now. We are weaving tapestries of landscapes and reminding people that the key to it all is to belong to a place. To belong to a place and to care for that place, and then to create relationships between places and weave it all across the planet. And that leads us to Regenerate Cascadia, which is the effort that brought Penny and me and Stephen, who's filming us so that we can document this because we feel like this trip we're on is going to make history. So we've been documenting it as we go. But I want to invite Brandon and Claire to come up and speak to you for a few minutes about Regenerate Cascadia to give you a better feel, not just for what kind of conversation we're having, but how this is actually going to continue and organize and grow, because the whole point of this is to start the conversation and then carry it forward. Thank you, Joe. Brandon 
and my name is Brandon Lutzinger. And for those of you who don't know me, um, I've been doing work around bioregionalism in Cascadia for about 20 years. Uh, I helped to start an organization called Cascadia Now in 2005. Uh, stepped away from that in 2016, 17, and then more recently started a new organization that's called the Department of Bioregion. And through the Department of Bioregion, our goal is really to help explore this idea of bioregionalism and what are the bioregionalisms, sorry, what are the bioregions of the world and how can we be um, connecting in with that work and helping empower uh, these con kind of conversations that are popping. Um, Claire and I, as Claire mentioned, um, we met in the Edge Prize and this idea of repairing Cascadia was born. Uh, the Edge Prize was a process that uh, took about eight weeks and then gathered 140 different community organizers and edge walkers from around the same nation to come and share and learn. And through that process, Claire and I met and realized that there's all of this amazing work happening in our communities, and a lot of us aren't talking to each other, and a lot of us aren't even aware of each other's work. And so I think there's an incredibly incredible opportunity um, when we start to come together. And Claire and I have done a really uh, nice job of inviting the Burr to come talk in Victoria. And we had this kind of like really crazy notion of like what, what would happen if we just kind of like, why, why just Victoria? Let's just like open it up to all of Cascadia. And then we realized that all of Cascadia is actually really big. Um, <laughs> so we kind of like shrug it back down a little bit. And so we started this, uh, this process with the Willamette Valley and the Salish Sea. Um, and it's, it's just been really incredible. So we started these conversations in like April and May. And then uh, and there was like four of us in the room. It was Claire, myself, Joe, Penny. Uh, and then it was like 50 people. And then like even like a month beforehand, it was like 50 people. And then it was like 100 people. And now it's up to 150 people. Um, and now I guess it's actually, like, I don't know, hundreds of people or something. And, uh, but uh, in 14 different communities and all having this conversation and all leaned into how can we start to shift these conversations into watershed frameworks? And how can we start to connect all of the work that we're doing, the amazing regenerative processes uh, and communities that are most impacted by these decisions? How can we weave that work together so that we're all just talking together um, and sharing resources um, and empowering each other's work? So one of the things that, um as a community artist, I was really aware of, but and we talked about and was coming up to doing the enterprise with people and then talking to people here too. Um, groups are, that are doing this work are often so busy doing the work that they're doing that they don't have the capacity to actually um, uh, find those connections. And then once they find those connections and have a bigger vision, just holding what that new vision is. And so that was actually a huge part of what also fueled Regenerate Cascadia, was creating some of the infrastructure that can help to um, identify, uh, map the, the different projects in place, and then help to um, create the, the structures that would be able to connect us. So. And as Joe talks about this really amazing work that they're doing in the design school for regenerating Earth. Um, what's really fun is that we uh, get to really challenge ourselves with how do we grow Cascadia as part of this planetary network. Um, we're in these communities for a very brief window. Um, in like about a week, I think Joe and Penny are going to leave and they're going to go back to first, I think, Colorado and they're going back to Columbia. And so if we want to make this change, um, it, it all starts with us, and it's up to us to kind of keep this going. And a big part of these conversations as well was the point of Regenerate Cascadia, the activation tour, and everything that we're doing isn't this talk here tonight. It's, it's this talk here tonight is the start of a conversation that we can continue forward. And the beautiful thing about that is that just as important as our conversation with how we create Cascadia as a node in this planetary network is our next question, which is, how do we weave together the work that's happening in this watershed? And that conversation starts with all of you here tonight. 
And I think what's been really amazing is in every community that we've gone to, um, regardless of the number of people who have come out, the quality of people who have come out has been really incredible. And our guess is that if you're sitting in this audience tonight, you're probably connected with some type of really amazing work or project. Um, and I think one of the coolest things about all of this work is that it's inspiring, it's hopeful. I think so often in the current political climate um, and environmental work or this or that, or climate crisis, it can be really disheartening, it can be really down. But when you actually start seeing the work uh, that's happening in the communities and talking with people who have the boots on the ground, uh, man, the work that's happening is so powerful. And that's been such a big part of this tour, has just been traveling around the region, seeing areas where dams have been removed, seeing areas where water and uh, rivers and light have been regenerated, forests and degraded landscapes are coming back, um, and also really seeing the challenges. That we really do have a lot of challenges, but I think what's really amazing is that all of us here, the community, that's, it's, the work that needs to be done is happening in the communities right now. Um, and so we want to document that, and we want to share that. And then a big part of that is that we get to share that with the world, because the world is leaned in and watching what we do. As Joe mentioned, there are four teams right now working in the Great Lakes to have an activation tour and a summit in 2024. There are teams working at, uh, in the entire, along the whole Colorado River to do the same thing there. And so everything that we're doing is being, everything that we're doing is being watched. And we're really working to templatize it, make these processes replicable. But really, that starts with these conversations and with all of you. Yeah, so um, one of the things that um, is really important is that we do get to know um, how, how is it that we can support you in doing the work that you're already doing. And um, we've got a summit that's going to be coming up from November 3rd to 12th. And uh, you know what you're doing, but we need, to, we need you to be able to come and share what you're doing and what are the issues and where, is, where are the places you need support in order to do your work better. And also, what has inspired you about what Joe, I mean, it's amazing we have such a um, kind of storytelling that brings coherence to how we can imagine the next steps with Joe and the whole team. And Penny's also a big part of that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the summit is um, a place where we're hoping to learn from um, and, and start understanding how we can even start putting uh, funding proposals together so that, the, that it's not just the structures that are coming into place, but also the, the resources that are going to be required to do this work. And, um, yeah. Yeah, and I think one really important thing that we want to explore through the summit is how we can come together to start crafting a regional vision from the ground up, uh, as well as starting to deepen the story of the place. So, both as a bioregion region and also in each watershed. More than that, we want to invite people to come together and help us start to develop uh, informational commons and bioregional frameworks. Where do we live? What are the, the frameworks and watersheds that we should be working within? How do we measure the inputs and outputs and if we're being successful or not? Um, I think, and then lastly, the big, a big focus too is exactly what Claire just mentioned, and that is how do we start weaving together these, the tapestry of different regenerative projects and communities uh, in an area? And then more than that, how can we connect them across landscapes, across watersheds? And so the two real areas that we're looking at are how do we connect um, with people in place, and then how do we help those communities and projects connect with each other um, through the NRS across place. Um, so for the Bioregional Summit, uh, the first weekend, uh, it will be November 3rd through 12th, but we're breaking it into different pieces, and this is meant to be a capstone event. Uh, we're not going to, you know, we're working within the, the realistic uh, expectations, I think, of what we're able to pull off uh, for an event starting next week, while we're also <laughs> finishing a 30 minutes. <laughs> um, you know, we like to set our, our bar. Uh, <laughs> so, but, um, but so the first weekend is all about um, the wisdom and knowledge from all of the work that you're doing. And 
so we want to invite anybody who might have something they feel like they'd like to share, uh, whether it's a presentation, a workshop, a discussion, um, it's entirely open for that. Anybody can submit a proposal or presentation. Uh, during the week, in the evening time, uh, Monday through Thursday, we will have ownership of car bags from different organizing teams, and so anybody who's helped host or organize one of these events will be able to talk about what they have done or, and the impact of what they've had, uh, some of the projects and challenges. And then the last weekend will be a Cascadia Unconference. And so that'll be a time when we get to come together. Anybody can submit a proposal for a work group or a session that they might like to host. We'll collaboratively create the agenda and then really talk among each other about what we want to see next. And a big part of that is that we're in each community for this event for a day or two days. And so now we want to get ourselves out you know, on the front of the stage and uh, remove ourselves with bottlenecks and just let everybody else connect and talk um, and see what comes of it. Um, if you like what we do, this has already been mentioned several times, so I won't talk about it too much. I'll just say that uh, Joe has a book. It's pretty cool. And if you buy one, I bet he'll sign it, and that's pretty neat. <laughs> Where's the summit? It's online. We're generally cascading the network and there's a sign-up sheet to, to get notifications. So there is one thing that I just wanted to add in, add in to the comment. We're going to be talking a lot more about community art and, um, and finding the people that are not part of the conversation right now. Community art is an amazing way of being able to engage a community, um, finding the artists and the yeah, the others that can help creatively hold what is the vision that you have for this community too. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and just to echo on that, the summit will be one way that we're going to bring people together and connect. But we would love to also hear from anybody who might like to continue this work here and create an, an actual group that continues meeting in person. So much of this tour is about getting off, off the <coughs> internet, offline, and actually getting to meet everybody face to face. And I think that's really important. And so this is meant to be a start of conversation. And we do hope to find um, people in each area who want to, who we get to work with and who want to work with us um, to continue this going. So not just regenerate Cascadia, but regenerate Bellingham, regenerate Whitby, and then all of these different groups working together to really explore what that might look like. And then I just wanted to end on this notion, if you're not aware, but this idea of Cascadia and bioregionalism has been active in our region for more than 40 years. And this all started on a sunny day in, in summer um, at Evergreen College uh, in 1986 when about 150 people gathered. And they gathered together as delegates from their watersheds, representatives of different animals, causes, groups, communities. And they came together to ask a very simple question. What would it look like if we stood up to take responsibility for our watersheds, for our home, um, for our, our bioregion? And 40 years later, we're just asking the same question. What would it look like if we stepped up to take responsibility for this region? And what would it take to regenerate Cascadia? Thank you. So I'd love to open it up for any questions, if anyone has any questions that they have. And I actually can pass this microphone around if that's helpful. Um, if anyone has a question, John, no comment. Yeah. So hi. So my name is John Springer. I was the person who said Joe earlier when I heard that it's 40 years later. I said, well, that's what that. <laughs> so what is going to be different? So, one thing I want to say to Brandon and Claire, that I've been around here long enough to know how challenging it is to be the board of and what a high standard we hold. You guys have done a fucking great job. Yeah. We're, 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 we're. <laughs> part of what I think is that it makes it a little more real with each other. And you guys are really just the distributed leadership model and all of the right ways of doing that. But 
you. Have you received that? That's a job. Thank God someone came to do that. We can't just like that. I had him take the gift like that and just say, oh, that's a bad thing. Thanks, Joe. I mean, there is the potential to organize our entire planet in a loving, indigenous, wise way. I'll never forget that. And I'll be summoned on your my face in life because we care. My name is Julie Carpenter, and I'd like to acknowledge some of the people in this room who organized that. I was all about organizing King Doug Dobbins. Yeah. And the video is, oh my god, we're all men. <laughs> like, so we need to be all this. Um, why am I the same age as all these old people? Exactly. So, um, anyway, thank you, Joe. That was really well said. Thank you for bringing us back together. Penny mentioned she's, that people are coming out of the woodwork who have been there and done this. And it's really neat to get together and share some of our progress. So I want to run the mic back to Doug Dobbins, who actually booked the Van Zandt Hall, and we can go further coming up soon. All right. Well, this started for me in the 60s, and uh, a lot of other people like me uh, said no more consumers. We're going to do something else. So Julie and I will be at the River Farm tomorrow explaining how land trust economics works. Uh, everybody here knows to look down much. You know, we really don't need to say the old thing, so I'm going to quit right here. Oh, I went ahead and uh, rented the Van Zandt Hall for November 25, 26, and we're going to do what's called a retrospective. And the purpose is for people to share the direct experiences they've had over the last how many years they've been in the work. For me, it's 60. For the planet, drum, it's 51. Uh, you know, I've walked along beside a lot of people, and I know that everybody has a story, and everybody who really wants to tell it truthfully will listen to each other because they want to be honored just as much as people will honor them. So, this ain't going to work without truth, and it ain't going to work without deep truth. So, what we're trying to do is talk from our experience what we know to be true, because we can't afford the digital mistakes that have been made. And believe me, this is a great idea, but there's a lot of people out there with a little clicker who will undo everything they can do if you don't watch out. I was about the formation of Greenpeace, he was there. Um, I wanted to just add one comment about what you've actually just experienced which is every place we've gone on this trip, we have come into direct contact with people who were originators of this movement. And because we had Stephen with us with a camera and Brandon so passionate about archiving, we've actually been interviewing a lot of these people to start to really archive and hold this story. And we're now talking with the Whidbey Institute, and with other groups throughout the region who have, and that was the Chinook Learning Center before the, the Whidbey Institute. It's, there are places that are a big part of this story, and there are humans who are a big part of this story. And what we're finding is that there is a readiness to bring together what the history really is. So thank you so much for naming the importance of that. And 
to create an intergenerational bond to the young people who have a completely broken future. Completely broken. And we have to walk this narrow path together. And so there's a really powerful process of healing available to us in this. And that for us to be able to, to meet with people like Lansing Scott and with others who, like, it's like everywhere we went, Dave McClowski and just like on and on, these people that have been there, Dave McClowski created a beautiful Cascadia map that's pretty well known. And there are others that just have been at this for a very long time. And for us to be able to, to just witness them and then for them to witness the young people coming into this, is just of, of such deep significance. It's, there are no words for it. And so, so just recognizing this has happened everywhere we've gone. And I'm sure it'll happen tomorrow. I'm sure it'll happen when we get to Skagit Valley. And as we continue walking this path, we're going to bring this light because there has been a lot of walking in darkness. And so... It feels so beautiful for me, like I said at the beginning, that I got to stand in this place where I'd stood with my dear friend, Michael Dowd, who helps, who's helped many people to see the truth. And to be able to sit in a place of love for life, even in our dark hours, to sit in that light of love for life, that this is something that endures. And it's not even about hope. It's not even about what we may or may not accomplish. It's about how we, what is, our, what is our way of being in a moment of planetary history like this? And the, the need for, especially for the young people, this has been a big theme for us throughout this whole trip, is that the young people need a different kind of education, a different kind of economics, different kinds of opportunities, and then there are a lot of old people who have broken legacies that don't know what to give or are not structured in a place where they can give what they want to give to the younger people. And I love that you mentioned community land trusts because one of the big ways this has come up is farmers who don't have people to take over their farms and no young person can afford to buy it. And so this is like these completely broken moments they're completely broken, which means we must invent something really different. And we have a lot of the tools to do it. Land trusts are a great example of a tool that we have. Co-housing, shared equity, blah, 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 insert a bunch of stuff because we have a bunch of stuff. What we don't yet have in most places is the direct personal connection between human beings who can walk this path together. And we saw this in Portland. We saw this on Vashon Island. We saw this on Whidbey Island. I saw this when I spoke to the mayor of Machosin, who's just off of the Saanich Peninsula, Vancouver Island. We have an agricultural area. I'm sure we're going to see it here, too. How do we walk this mending of the land by weaving the humans into a new tapestry? And so that's the real invitation here. And by the way, we're talking about big things like creating a Cascadia Regeneration Fund, creating fundable models for watersheds and landscapes, collaborating across the whole region. And I just wanted to name, because I lived in Seattle for nine years, I lived in Eugene for five, I was born in Missouri, which is actually in another bioregion with a long history. I grew up in the Ozarks, which had its first bioregional congress in 1981 but it was very strongly connected with Cascadia. And what I've seen in this, in this path that we're walking is that we have to bring our gifts. We have to bring our gifts and we have to walk into the future until there's a new dawn. And as we're doing this, what we, what we really can see is that none of the stories that are out there in the major discourse, the dominant stories, are just huge distractions. Just huge distractions. And what we really need to do is walk the land, listen to the earth, and partner with our neighbors. This is what we've always needed to do. But now we need to do it 
where our neighbors are across the planet. And I just wanted to name this as maybe a way of bringing us toward some closing for tonight, and then as we walk forward, is that there's a lot to learn from our indigenous brothers and sisters. There's a lot to learn from the wisdom traditions that they carry, but they have never had to deal with what all of us are dealing with now. This is a new human moment. And we need to create planetary indigeneity, planetary indigenous that is at the same time land and territory indigenous, which is what existed before. This planetary level has never happened before. This is new for everyone. And for us to create this is a process that is gonna take some time. Like I would say for Cascadia, to regenerate Cascadia, we probably need to be patterning this way of relating for 200 to 500 years. We're already about 50 years in, so 200 to 500 years more. But these forests are like 5,000, 10,000 years. You know, to get to the level of maturity of the mother tree and the old growth forest, thousands of years. So the human scale is going to be that we will walk a path that does not end when we give our bodies back to the earth. It continues. This is work beyond our lifetimes. Which is why it's so important for us to be humble. It's so important for us to serve and honor life where it is. And it's so important for us to learn to trust our neighbors. Because we need to be able to walk this path for a very long time. And so, yes, this activation tour is 30 days. Like, we're basically creating a spark of catalyzing conversation that grows out of many decades that came before so that we can continue for many decades beyond. And the difference is right now is we're entering the very crucible that will determine if humans remain part of the earth. From that very crucible. And it will last for several decades. And so... We have to live through that. And I can just say from my own experience, it has been incredible to go to a parched, degraded piece of land and help bring life. It has been incredible to do that. I have a daughter who's almost seven years old. She knows how to restore a dead river. Children need to learn this. And so there's a lot of work to do because there are a lot of dead rivers. But there's a living earth. And so the rivers can be restored. And so as we talk about not doing harm, doing less harm, of changing our consumer purchases and all that, which is it's okay as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough. And so what we really need to do is become part of the dancing menagerie of life, which we always were, but our conceptual capacities caused so many to forget. And then as we do that, we'll see it's going to continue into the future. And so what I hope is that you'll join us with Regenerate Cascadia because this is a story that can play across scales. And we need a story that can play across scales. So you can say, let's regenerate this bay, let's regenerate this river, let's regenerate the Salish Sea, let's regenerate the North American continent, you know, let's regenerate Turtle Island. And as we do this work, we're going to find our allies don't depend on indigenous categories. There's only one categorical distinction that matters. It's one that a friend of ours, Dan Longboat, who's from the Mohawk Nation in Ontario, he said that there are going to be those who choose to act in service to the continuation of life and those who choose to serve the destruction of life. And that is the difference that matters. So... I've seen false leaders in indigenous places just like anywhere else because wisdom is in the integrity of acting in service to life. And this is the place where we are. We need to act in service to life. So let's walk this path together. Thank you.